Hi everyone, good morning from Vienna. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Making It in Austria. My name is Adela Meijanic, and today I have a great pleasure to uh, welcome Aida Hairo to our channel. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, so, should I introduce myself shortly? Or? Yes, definitely. We would. I would love to hear uh, more about you. I. Before this interview, we, we chatted a little bit. It's an impressive resume, impressive um, life that you are having. So I would love you to share a little bit with us. So, okay. Hopefully it's impressive. <laughs> okay, so I'm originally from Sarajevo, Bosnia. Um, I was born in Sarajevo at the age of uh, one. And me and my family, we moved to Mexico City, where I lived for five years. And which was a really great experience to be as a child in Mexico City back then. Um, then after five years, we moved back to Sarajevo. And it was also a fun experience because uh, I was supposed to start the primary school, but back in Sarajevo, they told me, oh, she can't because she speaks only Spanish, so she has to go back to the kindergarten. So it was the first time in my life that I failed. <laughs> so they sent me back to the kindergarten, good. Uh, I learned Bosnian and then started school, started high school and in 92 when the war started we were in Sarajevo uh, but we couldn't stay so we we managed to leave after around three weeks after the war started so we were among the lucky ones to be able to leave and we went first to Belgrade and from Belgrade we did, we decided to go back to Mexico mm -hmm. because the country my father knew the language and so on and so on uh, and um, we stayed there for four months. After four months, it was my father who got an offer from at that time. The company's name was Power Tech. It was one of the biggest Austrian companies at that time, high tech. And, and uh, it was a consultancy offer for 100 days. So he decided to go for it. And uh, he had a very good friend here uh, who, who who himself was Jewish, so you know he has also experienced similar things. But he was consulting my father, and when my father came to Austria, uh, the first uh, his name was Karl Kohn, and he told my father, "So you're a stupid man. You're leaving a country. You know the language, and where you have previously worked, and you have contacts to 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 move to a country where you don't know anybody and you don't know the language." <laughs> my father didn't know what to say. <laughs> so, you know, so it was a consultancy. So we, 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 they gave us, they asked us at the beginning if we would like to live in a house or if we would like to have an apartment and if we would like to live in a house, it might take longer to find a house. It was all, you know, uh, strange because we would know what was happening in, Sar in Sarajevo back and the consultancy was only for 100 days. So it means after 100 days, what status do you have? Yeah. Are we a refugee? We don't know because we didn't come straight from Bosnia. We came from Mexico. So, you know, and we didn't have anything. We left everything in Sarajevo. So we came with a very tiny suitcase and we still have the suitcase because it's really this size. This was all we had. So then they found us an apartment because my father said, no need to, to wait for a house. <laughs> we are perfectly fine with an apartment. So we had an apartment in the 19th district, which was a very nice district. And yes, we arrived, it was sometime summer. And you know, in September, I was supposed to go to school at the age of 12, I was 12 that time. And I had the same, like uh, when I came from Mexico to Sarajevo, I didn't know the language. So, and first we tried to, my, I tried to get into one of the schools, high schools back in the 19th district. But the issue was again, the language, like back in Sarajevo, it was, and so they said, I mean, we, she cannot start going to school if she doesn't know the language. So she should first learn the language. But then, you know, for my father, it was, what should I do? Stay at home, attend language courses. So uh, luckily, one of his friends at the company that he joined, uh, a new old uh, head of a school in the 22nd district, which was one hour away from the 19th district, probably. And uh, this, this, this head of school said, yes, I, I mean, she can, she can join. She mm -hmm. can join the high school there. So it was what they call, I think, uh, gymnasium, the Al gymnasium. And, or she can immediately start going or she can decide if she would like to mm -hmm. take some 
German classes and then Google and my father said, no, she, she should immediately go. So then I started going to the gymnasium. I was sitting in the last row because I, I think it sounded to me like Chinese. <laughs> but uh, luckily, you know, we were very progressive back in former Yugoslavia at that time. So what this, what the students learned, what, you know, what we start, we were doing in mathematics, we had already done much more back in Sarajevo. So it all was like very simple for me. And, but nobody really thought that I could understand anything. So I was sitting in the last row and then we had this mathematics shulabat, this like, you know, one hour test and they scored very high. And so everybody was surprised, the teachers. <laughs> oh, they put me in the first row. <laughs> so suddenly I was sitting in the first row. I mean, it wasn't easy because now when I think I had to travel one hour from the 19th district to my high school, then I would sometimes travel back from my high school to, to home. Then I would have some lunch at home. And then I would go to like Maria Hilferstrasse uh, in Vienna, where I would attend uh, German classes with people who were, nine, uh, who were 18 plus, you know, because uh, mm -hmm. I would go there and then attend the classes there maybe sometimes for three hours and uh, yes. German. and luckily for the weekends there was a lady from Croatia and she would offer like uh, private lessons and I would go to her on Saturday and she would translate for me biology chemistry mm -hmm. and stuff like that and uh, I mean when you are then very it was very hard it was probably the hardest year of my life and I don't want to get too much into detail because I get emotional. But, um, you know, and, and the channel is making it in Austria. But then at the end of this first year, uh, I really made it. I learned the language. And uh, I was among the three best in the class, uh, which was good and not good. Because suddenly I first had this kind of, the people perceived me as somebody who, who, who still needs time. And then suddenly people perceive me as somebody who is exceptional. And then I had this image of exceptional and I didn't like it because then I felt under pressure to remain exceptional, you know? So when I finished high school and I went to the university, I told myself, now I will stop being very good. So I will take my time. So I started studying art history, hop to me, um, you know, or, Kunst management as well, psychology up to me. And then my, my psychology teacher, who was excellent, her name is Hilda Plaheta. She was like the second mom for me, and I met her at the high school. And she told me, Aida, when somebody is, uh, as, has as many interests as you have, maybe you should study business. Because with business, you can later on do anything you want. <laughs> manage a museum you know you, have, you can organize art exhibitions and so on so why don't you do that so and then i just to not regret not having subscribed at the uh, Wirtschaft university twin i also subscribed here and then suddenly you know they had like spanish classes there they had also like art management classes at twin so i started like running from one location to the other and then as time was passing, I was taking more and more classes uh, back at VU that were not core business classes. So I found all these selectives, you know, <laughs> to occupy myself. And I didn't have a good start because the first six months, I think I didn't achieve anything, but it was in line with my intention. So good. And, and then I got more interested in it and so on and so on. So then I started probably studying again hard, harder. Um, during my time, then I went one year, not one year, eight months, I went to the University of Texas, Austin, which was also an exceptional experience to be in the United States, mm. um, where I lived with Mexican Americans, because you always like to not find people you somehow feel uh, familiar with. Yeah. The Mexican Americans, they were not Mex they were not Americans, and they were also not completely Mexicans, but the very nice uh, combination of both. So I lived with three girls. Then I did my PhD at Vienna University. The reason why I did my PhD and I told my at that time um, supervisor, Gerhard Fink, um, he asked me, why do you want to do your PhD? And I told him, you know what, somehow I'm too fast. So I don't feel ready to leave the university. 
and my friends are still here and he told me okay this is perfect then you continue being a student you're just then a phd student and i said yes let's go for that <laughs> you know? so everybody was like you know concerned with getting it done and maybe also with publishing and i was thinking at that time so Boston Consulting, please more if you have a PhD. So it's good anyway to have it, but I don't have to worry about if these things are going to be published or not. I'll just do it. I finished and the PhD very fast um, be because just I think I got very interested in the topic and it was on multicultural teams and diversity. And so in 2007, so I asked my Gerhard Fink what to do, and he told me, let me apply for jobs, and maybe also go abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I applied for jobs. And at that time, I had already met my now husband. It was my partner at that time. And Harris uh, was working for G Capital. So he was traveling across the globe because he was doing the internal auditing. So he was in Japan for three months. And, uh, he was in Amsterdam for three months, and then he asked me, where would you like to settle down? And G, he didn't want to go to Vienna because he still wanted to save with G Capital, and G Capital didn't have any subsidiaries here. So I said, maybe this is this thing is uh, to go to UK because I know the language. I'm not, uh, I wasn't ready to go to the US because it was too far still from the family. And he said, okay. So he, he got them within G Capital a job in London. And I also very fast then, I mean, the, the British market is very dynamic. So I, I very fast got an offer um, and everybody told me I should live back here in Austria. So going then to London, we lived and I worked in London for six years. During this time, Hannah and Alan were born. Hannah is now eight, Alan is 11. And after six years, I told Harris, look, I mean, London is a great place to live. Nine million people, ex very diverse. I never felt like an immigrant or a foreigner. I just felt as uh, you know, as, as a mom now. Because yeah. <laughs> when we lived in the first, uh, in the first, it's not the first district, but it was the St. John, John's Wood area. And when I was on maternity leave, um, I wanted to get to know some British moms. But back in St. John's Wood, you couldn't get to know any British moms because it was so diverse. There were so many different women from all across the Europe and India and so on. So then I socialized with them. So this is the feeling you have in London. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, then, then I told Harris, but the difficulty was with two kids. One is very expensive and so on. And my parents, uh, and I felt also, you know, they should also have the chance to live with their grandchildren. And I told Harris in 2013, maybe we should move back to Vienna. So Harris, um, Harris um, um, agreed. So he started applying for jobs uh, with his uh, you know, CV. We thought, I mean, it's going to go very fast. But then at the beginning, he was sending applications. And he was getting only rejections. Uh, he started at his uh, level, the way he's qualified. Then he started levels below his qualifications and he received in one month he sent out 100 applications so he's received 100 rejections wow. so yeah uh, but uh, it was again this uh, i think relationship particularism aspect here in austria that you need to have some relationships to get uh, maybe a job fast or easier and we told a friend of us who worked at that time for erste bank that uh, you know looking we want to go back to vienna and he said, okay, we're restructuring the risk management department. Why does Harris not send me his CV? And yes, within three, three weeks, Harris had a job at Erste Group. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so we had to move. I haven't had the time to apply for my jobs because I was taking care of the kids. So, but I thought, Harris, don't worry about it. Um, uh, I will be fine. And um, and so we moved. I had also to tell my boss back at Brunel University London at that time that I was that we are moving. And uh, they asked me, do you think this is going to be sustainable for you? And I said, we will see. I've, I don't know yet. But then I, I stayed with Brunel University six more years, uh, living uh, here in Vienna and working in London. The, the nice thing was when you work there for a university and you're, you're good in research, you have your research outputs, 
then you have the negotiating power. So they can block your teaching. You can teach them only one term and they block everything in one term. And a term in the UK system is only 11 weeks. So you have to commute frequently during this 11 weeks, but then the rest of the year, uh, you can work from where you want as long as you meet the target. So, and this was also partly because uh, here in uh, Austria, there are two universities in Vienna, the Vienna University and the VU Wirtschaftsuniversität University Wien. And not many also positions advertised and also the relationship aspects. When we came back 2013, all the people I knew retired. So it was a new view for me. Um, this uh, aspect, so what did I want to say? I forgot, but I'll just continue. Maybe with what I didn't plan to say. Yeah, um, uh, 2000 maybe now also related to your channel's uh, focus mm -hmm. on making it to Austria. 2018, I mean, this story shouldn't sound like uh, discouraging, but uh, it's just the way things uh, can happen. But 2018, um, my current boss contacted me and I was still working full-time in London. And he asked me, Aida, there is this one position, it's 50%, but now in light of Brexit, would you mind maybe, do you want to consider it? You could reduce your contract back at Brunel University, go to 70% and you have a 50% position here. So just in case something happens. Mm -hmm. And so I took this 50% position and I kept my 70% position. And uh, it was last year that I got this permanent contract at tenure at Vienna University of Economics. So I will be employed until I'm five, I think in trans, <laughs> age of 65, I think it ends. You know, because in, in the UK also, you don't have the age aspect. Uh, you can be a professor with 75, uh, but uh, here it's limited to 65, which is, which, is, which is good. But you see, it went through the connections uh, with, uh, with, the, with, with, uh, with Michael Mila whom I got to know in 2007 back in London, because I started at a different university there and he worked there. So we got to know each other in 2007. And his story was a little bit similar. He lived in Hanover and worked in the UK again because, uh, you know, there are not too many universities and there are not too many opening positions. So sometimes you're left without a choice. So it's the specifics of this profession as well. Mm. well this is my story until now. See what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> what a story, Aida. What, what a story. And what is your focus now, um, focus of your research and your teaching at the VU Vienna? Okay, good. So I started like with diversity management because, you know, having moved and lived in these different countries, sure, this is a topic that's appealing to you. And also the Sarajevo was very diverse in a sense, you know, yes. religious backgrounds and so on. So maybe it was a great starting learning point as well for me. Um, um, and then 2015, I was asked to kind of join the project on immigrants. Mm -hmm. And then I thought immigrants, is this like expatriation literature? And you know, I wasn't interested in expatriation at all because an expatriate is somebody who's sent by the company's headquarters to subsidiary and they have, you know, the luxurious life and so on and so on. Like my father was back in Mexico. Mm -hmm. but. But then, you know, getting deeper into it, I realized, oh no, <laughs> I can't it. it's a different story. So, you know, and it has this uh, ethical aspects also behind this. There is also talk, I mean, in the context of migration, I discuss also topics of discrimination, stigmatization, and so on and so on. And uh, then I really got very passionate about it. So since 2015 and step by step, I was finishing off my other research projects and I was getting more into this topic of uh, migration. Um, and so what I do now is actually in the middle of the from the other interview as well, we read all this interdisciplinary literature because most people in our profession, you know, there is this term publish or perish, either you publish every year or you perish. So the implication is you don't read because you don't have time to read, you have to write. And so Milda and I, we are going the different route. 
we are we ordered all this book interdisciplinary books and we are now reading this memorizing this knowledge and we try to kind of bring it into the management field and into the international business field so the issue is then happens that you realize that some of the underlying assumptions behind our theories in management and international business no longer hold mm. uh, which makes it sometimes easy to publish uh, because if the editor is open to novelty then you get it published but if the if the we call this micro tribe the group of scholars who is territorial and holding a different sub-discipline within our um, field uh, then it gets uh, more difficult so but this is what what we have been doing uh, mm -hmm. recently also working with top level executives and with multinationals on this topic uh, you know on skilled migrants but also on low skilled migrants uh, how to improve the working conditions of low skilled migrants and this ethical recruitment practices and so on and as well issues related to the high skilled migrants and also how this whole aspect of migration has been almost completely ignored in business and management. Mm -hmm. um, and now by infusing it, we bring like, you know, like I said, also new insights into this and established theories, but also some counterintuitive aspects that may hopefully make us reconsider some of the in initial assumptions we have had. So this is what to, what we have been doing. So it's research, but also with a lot of um, involvement and joint work with uh, with uh, top level executives who are, and most of them also very interested and some also extremely passionate about this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of our collaborators is the vice executive president for strategic programs. I think it's his title, Paul Baldessari of Flex. Mm -hmm. Flex is one of the largest uh, multinationals. I think it's probably one of the six largest electronics manufacturing companies and uh, getting access to him and then the experiences of chief major officers and so on. So it has been really very fascinating journey so far. So mm. see what we get with this. May I have a follow-up question to that? Mm -hmm. So diversity and inclusion has been, it's a major topic in the last years. Mm -hmm. um, all sectors, especially, I mean, in the tech industry. So we, we talk about that a lot. So how diverse and in inclusive are we here in Austria compared to, I don't know, what would be the, uh, you know, the next better inclusive society or? Mm -hmm. So why, why is it taking so long? So what, what, where are we stuck? So because if I look at the, you know, um, big corporations, they all say, and they all, you know, put it on their, on their websites and um, they want to invest into that area and, and they see the potential and they see the, you know, what does it mean for their, you know, business and, and, and so on. But why does it take so long? Where are we stuck? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I, it's a very difficult question. It's a very good and difficult question. When we came to Austria in 92, and you would like walk the first district, you would, back then, you know, you would hear German, you would hear German language, and there were, it was, it was more of a homogeneous um, from the cultural background uh, mm. representation. Um, if you now go to the first district, it has changed a lot. So I don't know the exact numbers of how the cultural mix, uh, the changes to the cultural mix back here in, in, in Vienna and Austria. So, but it was definitely back in 92, not as diverse as, much as for example, London is diverse, you know? So I think maybe the British people were, were working on this diversity and inclusion for longer. And I, I feel in a certain way, they are also more skilled, but there is also this aspect of universalism Mm -hmm. You know, when you apply for a job in the UK, it's really what's on your CV. It's not whom you know. So, and this gives you a huge advantage from the very start. And here is still, and this is a cultural issue, mm -hmm. and I'm not objecting it because we are in Bosnia. We are also very high on particularism. It's whom you know, you mm -hmm. know. And, and this is an issue here in Austria that sometimes prevents maybe people who are extremely talented from entering the job market. 
So this is one issue of, uh, of diversity. The other issue is also what I think maybe companies sometimes underestimate is uh, it's good to have diversity quotas. You know, you want to increase uh, the quota of women, you want to increase the quota of certain nationalities and so on. But it's really how you're managing internally this diversity. Do you have what we call like an engagement focused climate where you have maybe a certain set of rules, but then these people have a lot of flexibility to be themselves and to do the work the best they think they should be doing it. So, and I cannot say now for Austria, oh, it's difficult for me, but maybe still will take some time to really mm -hmm. move towards creating this engagement focused diversity climates, also at the national level, but also at the organizational level. Although it has changed a lot, you know, the, also the other issue is, I felt really like a migrant back in 92 when we came from Bosnia, because I had this like stigma, you know, and I know once one of the difficult experiences for me, we were in a, in, at school, and I asked my friends, I mean, why, why are you so rude to me? Maya is also not Austrian. And then they told me, yeah, but you know, Maya is from Finland and you're from former Yugoslavia. So you had this stigma uh, from being from former Yugoslavia and Finland is like a developed country and we are coming from an emerging country. So this was, this was difficult at that time, but now I don't know maybe if I, if I, have developed more emotional resilience, but I feel like when I came, since I came from the UK and this was 2013, I haven't had any critical incidents, you know, anything that was related to my nationality or where I am from. So maybe there have been some changes going on, you know, I cannot say, but also at Vienna University from this aspect, I don't from being, uh, from my nationality aspect, I don't feel in any way kind of, of uh, discriminated or, but it was more, more prevalent back in 92. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it would be nice to see if there are any longitudinal studies, how has this changed? And it would be also nice to see if there are any studies of how the mix the national mix has changed also back here in Vienna mm. since then. So, yeah. all I can say so far. I have a very similar experience like you, Aida. So I, I, we moved here in 2013, my husband and I, and we have had a, you know, pleasant experiences uh, in, in my, you know, during my work and uh, later on studying here and, and working abroad. So I didn't... Um, you know, have this feeling of being different or or feel, uh, or somewhat discriminated or and so on. You always have these stereotypes, of course, like women in tech. What is that? And then the question mark and and how and so on. You get all, all these sorts of questions, but um, not not on a national level. I would say not where I'm nationality, so not where I'm coming from. But it was mostly something that uh, we observe in worldwide. So that women when they you know, come into the male dominated kind of world. It's like, wow, what, what are you doing here? Uh, so our experience have been very, very pleasant. Um, follow up question as well is, uh, or the next one is of course, for people who are considering to move to Austria, uh, what kind of tips would you give them? So no matter of, you know, the, the profession, so how can they maybe prepare for moving here? Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly you learn a little bit already in advance about the Austrian culture and the specifics of Austrian mm -hmm. culture. Uh, language is an advantage, although, I mean, I can, I, find, I see many people who don't speak the language who are fluent in English and still have great jobs and opportunities as well. Um, so this particularism relationship aspect, I think people shouldn't be discouraged by it because it could easily also be misunderstood. You may think, okay, they are discriminating against me, but it's not. It's just that they don't know you that well. And also, I think it has to do also with here with the labor laws and so on. So in Austria, for example, at Vienna University, once you have appointed somebody, you cannot get rid of him or her because the labor laws are so strict, you know, so you cannot fire. 
so sure, then you think, okay, maybe I should appoint somebody I know well uh, because of this. Whereas in the UK, after three months, you get laid off. This is fine. This is normal. So, but you can then appoint somebody you don't know that well because this gives you the flexibility. Maybe also this aspect. To, but one issue is really this particularism aspect. Do not misinterpret it. Do not think that this is uh, discrimination. To try to build these relationships also with Austrians, but also with the uh, migrants living back here. Mm -hmm. and learning from them but you also need to be i mean this is for me it's like persistent not giving up whatever i somehow learned this maybe also through the refugee child and you know the stories it's like really persistence pays up emotional resilience you learn as well i mean to be resilient in any way but also emotional resilient if uh, certain things happen and so on and so i mean people always say not lose hope but it's really to continue dreaming because dreaming is a way of planning. So just keep the fat, I guess. <laughs> For my tips, you know, I mean, really, things that help me is the resilience, is the persistence. And I'm a big dreamer. I constantly have my daydreams. My father <laughs> always tells me, Are you still here? And I say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> people who dream about the impossible who maybe end up doing the impossible so absolutely and it's in general like i said now coming back to 2013 i have a uh, very good friends i have a uh, um my boss is one michael miller carmen and i have an austrian boss my bigger boss who has been extremely supportive so So I miss sometimes the dynamic environment of London and also the multicultural mix back in London. Like here is more we Central Eastern Europeans and so on, which is also fine, but in London was ex this extreme diversity. And also because maybe you don't have the particularism aspect, you had always the feeling, I can really make it here, you know, so many different opportunities. And this is it so still when you look at the the universalistic countries are Canada, our United States, are the UK. And these are also the countries that host the skilled migrants worldwide. You know, so it's the language aspects that is an advantage, but also these other aspects that uh, that if you're really good in something, they kind of observe observe you, you know. So mm -hmm. this is uh, this is my I mean my suggestions for everybody wanting to. It's a, it's a it's a nice country to live in. Yeah, definitely. You already mentioned how important relationships are uh, here in, in Austria. And uh, one of my, and you're not the only one. So I, I, I know people from my, you know, my friends uh, who got the, the job the same way. So they were, they are, they are highly skilled. Uh, they studied here as well. They have a broad experience and they were sending CVs like there's no tomorrow. But when they finally met the person in that particular company who just put that CV forward and uh, it was the, the opening door. So it's, it's a very, very um, common, I would say, that people just, you know, you get this opening door, someone needs to open the door and then it's up to you again, if you have the skills, if you have the knowledge, if you know, know the work. So it's, it's good to know, as you said, it's really important uh, to know so how the, the system works. But um, in general, so either how do you network? So do you, how did you build up your network here, here in Austria? Is, is it diverse? So do you have any, any tips on, on that? Okay, so it's also an interesting question because when I came first, you know, before I started working here, I was networking only with the moms in the playground because my network is kind of long, you know. So, so I learned, I got to know many diverse moms from all different national backgrounds. Uh, I had the same issue in London. Um, sometimes funny incidents were when the, when, because our job, we can be very flexible, we work in the mornings and then in the evenings, and sometimes the moms would think that I'm a stay-at-home mom. And uh, so I would just uh, sometimes left them with this impression, <laughs> but good. This is another aspect. And then back at work, I mean, I started like Michael Miller Kamen, he's my wonderful boss. Maybe I'll send him the link to this channel so he knows. Definitely. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, I got to know the people at the department. I, I got, I mean, 
my big boss I knew from before. I got to work with Milda and this was really a great network. And uh, back at my department, I got to know also the external corporate contacts. And so uh, one of them um, also decided to do his PhD at VU. So I'm kind of a co-supervisor. So you, you kind of strengthen your network at VU, but still my network in this profession is, is extremely global because just to give you an example, I lived in UK for, for six years. I worked in UK for 12 years, but I wasn't doing research with anybody in the UK until 2015. This was the time I, had, I, I moved already to Austria because on diversity management, I connected with my co-author, Christina Gibson, who is one of the leading figures in this area. So, and she was in the United States. So you, you kind of uh, create this global professional network, which is a good thing uh, because you then don't depend on any particular employer because you have your network across the globe. So if something happens, um, you know, yes. it gives me some kind of feeling of security. And, um, and in Austria, I mean, I wasn't, maybe I should, but I wasn't working so much at establishing this network, but now that I'm like within the view, and it was also difficult, you know, before when you're like external to view, how should you do it? But now that I'm internal and you're given, you're given actually the opportunity finally to show what you can do. Mm -hmm. and so it's going like step by steps and uh, people who see what you can do are also the people who then end up, not all of them, because there is also jealousy, there is internal competition, uh, the issue of being a woman I experienced as well at uh, Vienna University. Um, but um, certain people then kind of, uh, they give you the opportunity, I don't want to say that they lift you, but they are opening the doors. Yeah. But, takes like time internally. So, so I think now I can see that this is happening and I know that there are certain people who are giving me almost their unconditional support, mm -hmm. you know, they really want me to stay and continue with, with what I'm doing. And so this is, this is how it happened, but I needed really to get in. I, I needed to get in and then it was step by step. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, uh, a colleague of mine told me you're like a satellite, to call this in English like that. And, and I, I, I didn't know what this exactly means, but this is maybe the migration background. And I asked him, what do you mean with that? And he told me, you know, it's always, uh, you know, it's, it's going around the earth, but it never lands. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, years I was observing because I was maybe scared to land. <laughs> if I want to land yet you know so I was also kind of uh, more on the distant side and now I'm more into it so yeah. which is fine but I still uh, try to keep my outside perspective to not assimilate into it because I think as long as I have my outside perspective I can also put something back that might be of value for the university as well so let's see what happens <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Aida, with, uh, with the network, it's your, I say always, it's your asset, you know, and, and as, you, as you said yourself, it's not something that is related to your current employer or, you know, current situation, it's something that you can, you know, take with you, whatever you, whatever, whatever you are going, so it's so, so important to, to build it up, and as you said, step by step, you know, it's nothing to, to force, I say, I, I don't like to force things, it's, you know, gradually building the relationships uh, for the future. Like they say, you know, in Boston, you cannot go with your head against the wall. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> we tried. It doesn't work. So for all the viewers, don't do it at home. Uh, <laughs> Aida, thank you so much for being our guest today. Uh, before we wrap up, I would like to know, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, yes. I, I, because I saw this picture. A picture. Yeah. I, I think this is the book I'm reading. And uh, it's returned to meaning a social science with something to say. <laughs> for my profession because we somehow lost a little bit the way and now we are going back to do really meaningful research so this has been what i'm reading it gives me like you know inspiration to continue because i realize many of the very risky things that you would not do in our profession yeah because either you succeed or you fail i i mean i've been doing because uh, and i've been doing this because i never was so much into really staying. It was not, not like the only option. Mm -hmm. 
there are people, they join academia, and then when you tell yourself, this is where I want to be, and this is the only thing I want to do, um, and then you create the kind of maybe anxiety and also the stress levels. And if you keep it open and you say, this is one thing I love to do, but there are still mm. many options I can go for, then I think it also reduces the stress levels and maybe in our profession, it does have an impact on creativity, so which is good. So this is the book I've been reading. So. Mm. I will link it to, to for our viewers. So if they want to read or check it out. Yeah, I think uh, Matt Alderson is the author of this book. He will be very glad to hear that. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the leading scholars in our field. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Aida, once again. Uh, it was a pleasure having you as a guest uh, with us. And thank you for sharing your story. And um, for all of our viewers, thank you for watching. If you like the content, so like, subscribe, share, comment, or if you know a guest or someone who would be a great um, guest on our channel, so let us know, write in the comment section or send me a message. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. And thank you, Aida, for being our guest once again. Yeah, bye.